So I would like to invite our two speakers, uh, Professor uh, Stephen Miles Uzo from the United States, to come here to the. Uh, thank you, and uh, and also uh, Professor Professor Yuan Kui Yang from China. Please come come here, or yeah. And, and so, aqueles que precisarem de tradução, tem fones disponíveis, tradução de inglês para português. E eu vou falar agora em inglês, então, apresentando os nossos dois convidados. So, thank you very much for coming here uh, to participate in this uh, urging uh, discussion uh, on STEM education in Brazil. It's a, it's a huge problem here, as you may have already perceived. Uh, we are very happy to have you here. And uh, the title of this session is The Challenges of STEM Education, International Perspectives. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Stephen Miles Uzo from the United States. So, uh, and, uh, and I guess uh, uh, each of you will have uh, uh, half an hour, right? To, to a timer at the back. There is a timer at the back, okay? So, and, and, and uh, half an hour, and then you'll have 20 minutes for discussions uh, with the public. Thank you very much, so please. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. So what I'd like to do during our time together is to talk about the importance of the integration of science, technology, engineering, and math, um, sometimes abbreviated as STEM, as we all know, um, to bringing authenticity to STEM learning in all its forms and how this effort's going on in the United States. But I'd like to start with a little history um, there was a realization back as far as 1950 that science research, as we knew it, was unsustainable. In the sixth International Congress on the History of Science, Derek de Sola Price predicted that the exponential growth of science would cause it to become so complex, data intensive and costly that we would soon exhaust our ability to support science as an enterprise. But toward the end of the 20th century, our ability to acquire data from nature accelerated rapidly, largely due to the revolution in fast and cheap computer systems and such things as small and cheap sensors and automated logging systems, high resolution remote sensing from satellites, robotic systems for shotgun DNA sequencing and protein mass spectrometry, computer modeling and simulation of everything from aerodynamics, fluid and particle systems to fundamental particles, to searching the skies for Earth-like planets, to modeling climate change to transform the way we think about nature and ourselves. Science has been utterly transformed and we're doing more science than ever before. Here are some statistics to put that in perspective. The number of currently active researchers exceeds the number of researchers ever alive. And this is globally. Some areas of science produce more than 40,000 papers per month. Computer users worldwide generate enough digital data every 15 minutes to fill the US Library of Congress. And more technical data have been collected in the past year alone than all previous years since science began. We're gathering data at such a fantastic rate that the problem now is analyzing them all and making them useful. What this also means is that Derek DeSola was right. But instead of the end of science, what's happened is the technology has by itself changed the very nature of how we do science. The tools allow us to do things that would have been much too costly to do without them. It's radically changed the way we think about such things as the capacity to unpack complex chemical interactions related to protein synthesis, to engineering biological and molecular materials, and of course with computers we can leverage very sophisticated analytical techniques on very large amounts of social, biological, chemical, and physical data, and greatly expand the ease with which we use modeling, stochastics, and prediction as a routine way of doing science and engineering. Computation is so deeply embedded in science and engineering, and the math so complex and intensive that doing anything by hand is just unthinkable anymore, without a lot of, with, and with a lot of inexpensive and ubiquitous computing power, there's really no need to. For instance, we can now run Monte Carlo localization particle filters on a smartphone, something we couldn't do um, except with a supercomputer a few years ago. Most importantly for our discussion today is this revolution in science has revealed that the boundaries of once revered silos of science disciplines, such as biology, chemistry, physics, and earth science, are disappearing, and that as the domains of science cross boundaries among other domains, they reveal STEM to be a truly interdisciplinary, living, breathing creature 
that evolves over time as it adapts to the cultural context of technology and human, human innovation. For instance, here's a map of science. Thanks. Here's a map of science, um, uh, of all science, based on citation indices of millions of scholarly papers gathered from the Scopus and Web of Science databases. On the left are time slices from 2004, uh, I'm sorry, from 1974, and on the bottom from 2004, showing the flow of knowledge in biochemistry. Green is biology, blue is chemistry, light blue is biochemistry, and magenta is bioengineering. The top image is from 1974, and during that year, more knowledge was flowing from biochemistry into other disciplines than from any other. Also, biochemistry produced more knowledge than it consumed from analytical chemistry, general chemistry, and other disciplines, a significant trend that can be seen over 30 years suggests that biochemistry and bioengineering are moving steadily into chemistry territory and having a large influence on the general knowledge base. If this trend continues, the boundary between biology and chemistry will likely disappear within a matter of decades. There are similar trends in physics and material sciences in which nanotechnologies and bioengineering are invading physics. And not far behind are trends in physics rapidly invading social science. One example is the science of complex networks. And here's a graph showing citation frequencies for watershed papers on complexity science topics. Note the marked increase in um, um, here in uh, network science topics over the past decade. These papers are interdisciplinary physics papers that study everything from technological trends, communication networks in biology and neuroscience, to protein interactions, to socioeconomic systems. Studying these kinds of complex systems was impossible 20 years ago, but demand a strongly interdisciplinary approach to identifying and analyzing complex systems in any domain. Also, here's an example in sustainability science, which is defined as the large-scale data and statistics that define the environmental, social, and economic parameters of the way humans behave in their environment and the byproducts of those behaviors. It examines the intersection of socioeconomic systems and earth systems. The circles on the map, here, show sustainability citations throughout the disciplines. And on the lower right, the growth of the research papers on sustainability science over here. The result is being able to create indicators of large-scale phenomena that include earth science data and socioeconomic data that can be used for decision making about policies with implications for sustainability of our species. For instance, here is a NASA study of human appropriation of net primary productivity on Earth. On the top figure, the original satellite-derived quarter-degree net primary productivity shows the spatial distribution in grams of carbon. That's here. The second um, um, uh, diagram here in the middle shows um, human appropriation of net primary productivity, also in grams of carbon. And on the bottom, um, is a human appropriated net primary productivity as a percent of net primary productivity. These are derived from a combination of visible and multi-band infrared satellite images and tabular data by country on total estimated consumption of net primary productivity in the form of food, paper, wood, and fiber. Data like these are used to develop international protocols on climate change and other important policy documents, truly important work and truly interdisciplinary. Increasingly, this revolution in interdisciplinarity in data science is influencing decision making in many sectors of the economy. Global business, banking, and whole economies are now much too complex not to use massive amounts of data for decision making. Market transactions have changed from purely human process to over a million trades per second. Business acumen is being replaced by smart predictive algorithms, in many cases making decisions through analyzing streams of data without any human intervention. And as we know from the mortgage crisis of 2009, and recently the New York Stock Exchange shutdown this past July, the technology and data continue to be ahead of the ability to our ability to control and make sense of them. The transformational effect of these trends is reflected in a transformation in the workplace throughout domains. And the kinds of skills demanded by everything from startups to Fortune 500 companies to research labs have dramatically shifted away from a focus on individual compartmentalized skills in hierarchies to re nimble, highly creative, collaborative, interdisciplinary, and analytical skills. The kinds of questions we ask of ourselves, the degree of complexity of the nature of all scales, and the complexity of the problems policymakers, industry, 
and citizens are called upon to solve are increasingly interdisciplinary and complex. The routine, manual, and repetitive tasks are either completely automated or are no longer relevant. Yet the demands on our educational system behave as if we were back in the 1950s again. Over that period, that, that technology has been transforming our culture, the need to better align education with STEM practice has been increasing. And there have been efforts since the 80s to anticipate the interdisciplinary transformation of STEM practice and develop frameworks for STEM learning to evolve in concert with STEM practice. Much of this thinking goes back to the American Association for the Advancement of Science project called Project 2061, at least in the United States. It was the most important initiative to integrate STEM throughout formal and informal learning. It was called science literacy back then. And focuses on meaningful integration and contextualization of science, technology, engineering, and math. It remains the most important framework for integrating STEM into lifelong learning and teaching and learning practice. Project 2061 and the ideas it, it stimulated are the basis for the interdisciplinary cross-cutting and engineering national standards for science and math that are currently under adoption throughout the United States. Over the same period, there were a number of intra- and interdisciplinary programs, projects, learning curricula, and assessment research around the idea of an integrated approach to STEM. But very few of these were integrated well into instruction, well evaluated, or widely adopted. They were mostly done as add-ons to instruction. The kinds of learning goals they set out to achieve were rather vague, and how to assess these revolutionary ways of thinking about STEM were largely based on standard classroom performance measures or too dependent on anecdotal, unstructured, or qualitative data. So the National, Engineer National Science Council and National Academy of Engineering sponsored a two-year study to determine what the nature and quality of learning was taking place and the salient research related to these integration efforts and initiatives. The result was published in this study, this study, which is available freely online. Um, you just have to search for it on the National Academy's website. Um, and was um, sp supported by uh, a grant from the National Academies, the Bechtel Foundation, um, with additional support from the National Science Foundation, as well as a couple of other foundations, private foundations. The committee who authored the report were drawn from a variety of disciplines and sectors, including the research and university and formal inf and informal learning sectors, which is too small to read probably for most of you, but it's all um, uh, printed in here as well. The outcomes of this report included a proposed common framework for STEM integration for K-12 education research that was based on the needs identified in the report and which encourages researchers and program developers to focus on a particular set of goals and outcomes as well as defined approaches. And it also included 10 recommendations that cover all the areas of the study, including research, outcomes, design and implementation, and assessment, which we'll go over briefly here. Under research recommendations, the study indicates the quality of STEM integration research must provide richer descriptions of the STEM integration interventions, alignment of study design, and outcome measures with goals of intervention and a more extensive use of control groups to reveal and mitigate confounding factors and biases. The field, including educators, program developers, and researchers, could benefit greatly from a common framework for both description of the intervention and, when appropriate, for the research strategy. The development of such a framework could be informed by what I showed you on the previous slide. As far as outcomes, integrating STEM is not a panacea for all the ills of STEM education. It's important to clearly identify and explain the impact of STEM integration programs on achievement, interest, identity, and persistence. And under interest and identity, examine long-term impacts on diverse audiences, which will require much more emphasis on, on longitudinal studies and things like, so, on, including uh, elements like social capital, particularly in diverse cultural and learning contexts. Under design and implementation, a clear delineation of logic models will help to understand reasoning and processes behind STEM integration interventions. And having an explicit teaching and learning goals will help clarify and pr and the, the purpose of the intervention. And by corollary, understanding learning goals and expected learning progressions will help gauge the effectiveness of the intervention. Under the assessment recommendations, assessment needs to be completely rethought when it comes to the interdisciplinary nature of STEM integration. 
we need a much better understanding of what the impact of STEM integration programs are that are not on the test and do not show up in educational statistics. This is a very hard to do with many of these programs, the way that many of these programs are designed, um, because they often they either look too narrowly at standardized achievement testing or they do not adequately test effectiveness at all. Finally, is the need for those programs to not be too widely deployed without an intent to learn from the experience they bring through implementation and use assessment in a rigorous way to iteratively improve these programs. So I'd like to make the last part of my presentation what I believe the steps in making this leap from the report recommendations to actualizing meaningful change in teaching and learning for STEM integration, K-12 and beyond. I guess this would be more characterized as a hypothesis of change because I think we, we're going to have to apply some uncharted waters with very different approaches to learning science around STEM integration if we want to better prepare our citizens to continue, continue to be productive, innovative, and further the cultural goals of our societies. The aphorism about the def definition of insanity being doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, though never actually said by Einstein, doesn't make it any less salient. And since the revolution in science did not come from doing things the same way, we need to avoid trying to solve problems with STEM integration of K-12 education the same way we created them. Most importantly, I think there's a consensus among some of the best minds of science learning that we need to rethink the study of learning. Most of the ways we've been studying how and what people learned in the past are based on the same kinds of things we test for in the classroom which don't tell us much about how people think, but what information they have stored in their heads. I think this will only happen if we have large scale, likely international and very widely interdisciplinary initiatives to rethink how we study learning and develop a framework from, with a commonly understood systematic. Perhaps this could start with cooperation between countries like the US and Brazil in this important work, but would ultimately need a global response involving many of the very sectors of STEM practice we want to prepare students for. This would include better leveraging of emerging understanding of the human mind, thinking and neuroscientific basis for human learning. We also need to better understand how and where teaching and learning takes place. This includes many contexts we are probably not even thinking about currently. It also includes the kinds of learning that happen in real problem solving and critical thinking every day, and the kinds of social capital that are needed to support persistence and deeper engagement among students and teachers and caregivers, as well as mentors of all kind. We need to work with policymakers and funders for supporting meaningful transformation of teaching practice. So what are the things we need to change in learning science? As we learn more about how the brain processes language, thinks about things, acts in space, and how knowledge evolves both socially and in individuals, the more problematic conventional ways we conceive of learning seem. We've been for too long linearizing and physicalizing something that is emergent and self-organizing ignoring the complex social and cognitive interactions that actually comprise learning processes. What we try to understand as sta stable concepts are dynamic network systems, yet we continue to think about education as a distribution of packets of information to be stored. And as we are increasingly aware, the standard atomistic model of learning is broken. Yet every time we violate this model, at least in the United States, we go down a rabbit hole. I believe we're turning at a turning point in learning science and learning practice and that institutions like the National Academy in the US and Brazilian Academy here are uniquely positioned to take the lead in transforming how we study learning. A few of the indicators in education that point toward how we need to rethink the study of learning include the problem of superposition, which means success is defined by additive, one concept added to another. But our only means of validating this process is through the self-referential systems we've created to measure them. In other words, tests. And those measurements were created based on the limits of those systems. We also don't acknowledge or understand what other possibly adverse effects conjoining these properties may have on learners or what the potential of learning is outside these self-validating systems. Next, we think associatively, therefore we learn associatively. And these associations are the lens we each bring to learning. The structure and process is a dynamic interconnection of entities based on dynamic systems. We must focus on the structure of causality and processes rather than the distribution of things to understand learning progressions and pathways into fluency and mastery. People don't learn in a vacuum. Learning systems are multi-layered and multi-scaled among individual groups, society, and culture, and understanding dynamics and interscale effects will be required to develop accurate learning models. We need to know more about the ecosystem of information and social capital in which people learn. Similarly, we are what, are, what are categorized as 
fixed self images, which are the things of learning, like science facts, function in complex dynamics and have their own evolution and behaviors in social and cognitive systems that need to be studied. This will also help think about the problem of consistent language and meaning in STEM integration because of the different domains have evolved different words for the same things and the same words for different things. The pace of understanding how the brain works and processes of creativity and attention are becoming evident through burgeoning connectome research in large-scale brain networks. Although there is a long way to go for a comprehensive neural model of learning, we know much more about what's going on than we did in the past and how this can inform learning research. Uh, one example is the, uh, the uh, recent um, discovery and theorization of what's called the salience network, which has been implicated in dynamic transition from default mode, um, which is um, the brain at rest, um, to uh, central executive functioning, which could be considered sort of thinking or being able to think. Importantly, there appears to be a large-scale switching function, possibly elicited in perception action loops, pointing to the mechanics of attention. Then creative thought activates a kind of synchrony tuning of different parts of the brain. In very broad brush terms, this is how we navigate, think about, and solve problems in our environment. But we tend to focus a lot on the phenomenology of learning and less on the underlying processes. These are not black boxes anymore. What this leads us to are big questions about what, where, what and where learning happens. Where does the cognitive aspect of learning end and social learning begin? Where does thinking end and action begin and vice versa? Answering these questions requires a different kind of mapping and reference system than we currently use to define engagement, including such things as language, sensory and environmental or extended cognition models, what we're increasingly calling an action, which is rapidly eclipsing the computational models for cognition that have been gripping cognitive science for so long. We have to acknowledge and infuse STEM education with new kinds of skills that, are, uh, that the revolution in 21st century data-driven science demands as part of developing approaches for educating the next generation of STEM literate citizens, including putting more emphasis on designing, construction, and visualizing data through analysis tools and computational thinking about problem solving. Correlation and juxtaposition of different data types may help to model and synthesize solutions more effectively than categorizing and homogenizing them. Exploratory skills supplant inductive skills. Finding patterns, then seeking to characterize those patterns in other processes can be beneficial. For instance, seeking the intercellular processes that lead to disease in tissue may benefit by even looking at things like the social evolution of cities. This is aided by using interdisciplinary approaches to encourage learners and researchers to cross domains and compare and contrast processes. There needs to be an emphasis on a new paradigm for analyzing complex systems of interaction through the dynamic, statistical, and spatial relationships. Search engines are obsolete. Semantic approaches are rapidly emerging to deal with complex data at large scales. Natural language and relational thinking to link data and make discoveries are going to be what these students face in the future of science. Cyber infrastructures are making large data sets more available and interoperable. New tools must be developed to make it easier to process and manipulate different data together and by users at any intellectual level. Dynamic data are everywhere now, but we need to have better informalize how to analyze data streams and build frameworks that help make sense of them. <clears throat> in order to prepare the next generation of STEM-aware citizens, scientists, and engineers, we need to embrace an approach that begins to wrap our minds around the complexity of learning, interdisciplinary approaches, and bring analytical paradigms to increase our understanding of the function of these complex interacting systems of learning. But there needs to be a will and exposure to the research environment to train these tools onto the study of learning and assessing them. This will require a strong, durable partnership among learning scientists, policymakers, curriculum specialists, and complexity scientists. In the future, this will likely include leveraging research at both the cognitive and neural levels, such as the mechanics and chemistry of inhibitory and excitatory properties within neuronal networks, better dynamic models of neuronal networks at larger scales, and more study of structure of dynamics of such things as potentiation and synchrony among brain modules. The interface between cognitive and social systems needs more study, including the role of various reference systems such as language, visual representations, and models, and the complex ecosystem of social capital and resources that affect learning in individuals and diverse cultural groups. This is particularly important in high-need and underserved communities of learners. And good longitudinal work over decadal spans of time 
on how learning evolves and persists in psychosocial environments and what happens to learning in, in learning environments, both formal and informal, that facilitates or inhibits learning or the use of, and, or the scaffolding of learning needs to be characterized better and used to develop effective learning environments. Finally, thinking outside the box of school. Increasingly, we're discovering that the real learning happens throughout people's lifetimes and what has been sometimes characterized as lifelong and life-wide learning. John Falk's diagram here shows formal learning in orange and informal learning in blue. The amount of time we spend in the classroom learning is a fraction of learning that happens throughout our lives. And that learning is through webs of thought, webs of language and communication, webs of knowledge, and webs of social interaction. Placing more emphasis on the kinds of learning that happens outside the classroom through technology and life experience and through cultural institutions and programs is important. This idea is not new. In, the in 1970, even Illich famously described learning webs as communities with many routed pathways into learning. The idea radical at the time was essentially to account for and integrate learning into the social fabric of society. Learning webs acknowledge the complex ecosystem of learning both within individuals and societies and that authentic learning happens everywhere, not just in schools. And that there are opportunities to develop new teaching practices that fundamentally shift from the what toward the how of knowledge. And in combination with new models for learning, we can both better understand learning structures that provide naturalistic pathways for higher order thinking of a, of a kind that evolve and develop models of praxis and teacher training that will look very different than what we are currently doing. I think opportunities for comparing, contrasting, and seeking scaling effects for connection among social, cultural, psychological, and cognitive systems is a pretty open field right now. As we build evidence for how these connections work, we'll be able to develop much more thorough and practical models for learning processes and approaches needed to integrate them into practice. With this, what this means is for STEM integration, we need to literally think outside the box of current teaching places and practice, how we conceptualize interdisciplinary STEM and its societal context and ultimately leverage this new knowledge to study learning across settings, cognitive framings, and throughout the human experience in order to better understand what we are integrating STEM into, how learning emerges, and ultimately how this informs policy and supports learning and teaching. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation of ABC. It's my great honor to give a talk here. And uh, today I will uh, be on behalf of our LBD group to give a talk about the development of Learning by Doing project over 15 years in China here. And uh, my report is not about research, it's about an educational practice project in China. So, and uh, tomorrow my colleague will give uh, talk about the neuroscience and the education in our group tomorrow. So uh, my topic is the development of uh, learning by doing project in China. Uh, this, this is Dr. Wei Yu, and uh, she is former vice minister of Chinese Ministry of Education, and also the former president of Southeast University in China, and also former vice president of uh, CAST, and uh, she is uh, academic, academician of Chinese Academy of Engineering. She is our group leader in our uh, center, and uh, she is the most important pe person in China uh, in science education area. Uh, and uh, we have two institutes. Uh, one is Research Center for Learning Science in our Southeast University, and we focus on the uh, how children learn from the perspectives of psychology and the neuroscience. And uh, uh, LBD, Learning by, uh, Learning by Doing Project, is one of the uh, group in our center. And we also have a uh, collaboratory of child development and uh, learning science of our Ministry of Education. And uh, uh, my colleague will uh, give detailed information about these two institutes, uh, how, what we, we do tomorrow. Uh, Learning by Doing project uh, is an inquiry-based science education activities in kindergartens and the primary schools. So we focus on kindergarten children and uh, primary school children from about uh, uh, five years old to 12 years old in China. 
And the goal, uh, goals of LBD, we have eight goal, uh, goals. Uh, the first one is protect the children's curiosity and inspire learning in, uh, initiative of science. And the second is simulated imagination and expand scientific thinking. The third is access important scientific concepts and the linkage between the scientific concepts. So we, uh, we are we very under, underline the big ideas and, uh, in, in uh, science education. And the fourth is learn the skills of science, uh, science inquiry. Uh, in the uh, next generation of science standards in USA, they use the practice to instead of the inquiry skills. And now we are uh, translating the next generation of science uh, standards uh, to Chinese now, and it will be published to, uh, next year. And uh, the fifth is improve the ability of cooperation and communication of the children. And the sixth is promote the development of language and expression uh, ability. And the seventh is to train the students to learn the attitudes of taking the in, uh, initiative to explore. Uh, and foster the attitude of the cooperation and seek the truth from facts. So uh, we, uh, we are very uh, un, uh, underlying that the uh, uh, education is a uh, habit. Habited. So we, are the no uh, we, we think that uh, the knowledge is not the very most important thing in kindergarten and uh, primary schools. We have to uh, raise our children to, uh, to have the uh, ability to uh, integrate different kinds of knowledge to solve the problems, and uh, they, uh, we have to raise the children the, the habit of inquiry. inquiry. So we, we think that the knowledge is not the very most important thing in kindergarten and uh, in primary schools. And uh, we also have uh, the nine principles of, LOB, of LOBD. Uh, so I, I do not have enough time to uh, read each one, so I go, go on. Uh, the development of LBD, we have uh, five stages. The, uh, the preparing stage is from uh, 1994 to 2000, and the first stage is from 2001 to 2003, and the second stage is from 2004 to October 2006, and the third uh, stage is from October uh, 2006 to 2010, and the fourth stage is now from uh, 2011 to now. The preparing stage is from uh, 1994 to 2000. The main task is to uh, investigate the international trends of science education and get a broader overview of the present situation. So this is uh, the conference in Beijing in 2000 years, uh, the International Conference on Primary School Science and Mathematics Education. So from, uh, from that time, we, uh, the, we, uh, the M uh, Ministry of Education and the CAST clear, clearly point, pointed out that the inquiry-based science education will be conducted in basic education in China. So uh, from um, that time, uh, we started the inquiry-based science education in China to instead of traditional science education in basic, uh, in basic education. Uh, in 2001, MOE, CAST, and CAS co uh, initiated the Learning by Doing Science Education Reform Project. It is an important education reform project aimed at promoting the development of China's inquiry-based inquiry science education in kindergartens and the primary schools, and exploring how to effectively achieve the goal of quality education. So uh, the quality of education is a, a very special term in China, <laughs> you know, the quality education. Uh, it has a lot of expl explanations uh, and uh, in uh, 2003, the uh, MOE and CAST has published a, a policy paper about the uh, a national document for LOBD program. So from 2003, the LBD program has been the national project uh, in basic uh, education uh, about the science, science education. And uh, at the beginning of our uh, project, uh, there are only four pilots and uh, 44 schools in 2001. Uh, there are Beijing, Nanjing, Shanghai, and Shantou, four cities in China. And now we have 22 pilots, uh, 2,000 schools, more than uh, 200,000 students participate in LBD. 
uh, in 2000, uh, 2002, the delegation of Academy of France visited China. And uh, we are very uh, commemorated to our great friend and teacher, Dr. Georges Champak. Yeah. Uh, he uh, help, helps us a lot. He introduced the uh, Lama Lapa project from France to China. So we, we can set up the uh, uh, LBD program in China. He helped us a lot. And this is our website, uh, handsbrain.com. Uh, this website was set up in 2002. So this is a platform for the national uh, training, national training for science teachers. And we have a lot of cases and modules on our website. And this is the uh, national website in science education reform in China. Uh, we have a lot of resources in this uh, uh, website, but uh, they are all in Chinese. They are all in Chinese for the teachers and the trainers. And uh, we also have the uh, website for our research, research center for learning science in our South, uh, South University. And uh, our center focuses on the how children learn in, uh, in uh, science, in mathematics, in uh, social emotional competence from the perspective of psychology and uh, neuroscience. So my colleague will give some detailed information tomorrow in his talk. And uh, we, uh, at the beginning, we translating French teach, teaching modules into Chinese, and we published some books uh, and other resources for science education. Uh, this is, uh, we translated uh, a French website, its name is Neuroscience for Kids, into Chinese. And uh, uh, a lot of uh, Chinese uh, parents and uh, teachers have read these books. And uh, some, uh, and uh, a lot of children in, uh, secondary school and high school can read this book. So uh, these, uh, these four books has uh, advanced the ch uh, Chinese, the, uh, the population, uh, popularization of the brain science into public. So it's, uh, it's very important uh, milestones in Chinese, uh, in Chinese uh, science education. And uh, we have sent fif uh, 50 teachers to France and uh, get their professional development sessions, and uh, about more than uh, 500 teachers has been trained in China by French trainers, by French trainers. And the second stage is from 2004 to October 2000, 2006. Uh, the main tasks are extending pilot areas to 18 provinces and cities, and uh, uh, inquiry and discussion on national standards uh, of science education in primary schools. Uh, developing uh, teacher's guide content standard and mo modules with Dr. Patrick Rowell. She's from uh, Canada, and she's uh, a very famous expert in science education, and she also helped us a lot to uh, develop the uh, teaching modules and uh, the training books for teachers. And uh, we, in 2004, we have some experience in the learning by doing inquiry based science education. So we collect, about, uh, we collect five modules from the uh, teachers and uh, different, from different uh, provinces and cities. And uh, we published uh, this book. Its name is Learning by Doing in China. Uh, this, these five modules are native, are native not, not translated from uh, French or USA. Five uh, native modules uh, from the teachers uh, in primary schools and in kindergartens. And uh, in uh, 2006, we have held the workshop on the content stands of LBD. It's held by MOE, CASP, uh, Chinese Academy of Science, Chinese Academy of Engineering. And uh, in 2006, this, uh, this book has, pe has been published. It's, uh, uh, it is written by uh, Dr. Wei Yu and Dr. Uh, Patrick Rowell. Uh, it's a teaching guide of inquiry-based science education. Uh, so it's uh, the guide for the teachers to understand what is science, what is science education, and how to implement, how to, how to conduct inquiry-based science education in schools, in primary schools and in kindergartens. So it's a training book for teachers, for teachers. And uh, the third stage is from October 2006 to 2010. We have pu uh, published the content, stand, content stands of LB, LBD. 
and developing the uh, IOBD teaching modules. And uh, we re re uh, revised the national standards of science education in primary schools with the out outcomes and the experience of IOBD. Uh, and uh, we develop a new joint platform of M MOE, CAST, and the CIS as applied project for national science education and promoting IBSE in China with the support of GE Foundation and the Li Kaxing Foundation. So uh, in this period, in this stage, we have, uh, we have built a national teacher training center in our uh, group. So we train uh, about uh, more than 200 trainers in different, from different provinces and uh, cities in China. And uh, when they go back to their uh, province and cities, they will train the teachers. We train the trainers. We train the trainers. We have built a national system to do this work. And uh, LBD has been uh, rec recognized by public and government agencies in China, as well as the International Forum of Science Education, IAP, RBSE. Dr. Wei Yu got Pukka uh, Prize in 2006. And LBD, LBD has become a sound foundation for revising the national standards of science education in primary schools. LBD group got the first class award of education research from MOE in 2010. Uh, this is the uh, France-China meeting uh, in France. Uh, since two, uh, 2001, we, have, we held the uh, meeting between France and China every year. Uh, one year in China and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the next year in France and the next year in China. So we uh, have have a lot of cooperation with France Academy of Science. And uh, uh, in 2007, uh, uh, we published the content standard of, L of LABD. And uh, uh, in the content stand standard of LABD, there are four science domains. There are material and physical science, life, sci life science, earth and environmental science, design and technology. And uh, we also uh, uh, load uh, some uh, content about inquiry skills and the social emotional competence. Uh, there are four domains for in, in, uh, in science domains. And uh, the content stand of LBD, so the detailed information about uh, each domain. Uh, for example, the materials and the physics science, we have include the matter and, and energy effects and uh, movements of the force. And uh, in, life science, in life science, we have main characters of lives, main difference between animals and plants. And we also have human beings and creatures. And uh, in earth and uh, environmental science, we have the natural environment is a changing system. And the earth is one of the planets in the solar system. And uh, the human beings activities affect the natural environment. And in design and technology, technology can solve the applied problems. So, and uh, this is our professional development fram framework for our uh, science teachers. Uh, we have a different training system for different level uh, teachers. So for the new teachers, uh, we, have, uh, we have the introduction training module. And uh, the teachers and the trainers get entrance to the LBD. They just uh, uh, learn what is LBD, what is inquiry-based science education. So the major context is the intro introduction of science. What is science? IBSC and LBD uh, in in instruction of IBSC and uh, assessment of I I IBSC. What is the formative assessment and what is the summative assessment? So we, we teach the, ch uh, the students about this content. And th this will be last uh, about two weeks for the new teachers to enter the LBD or inquiry-based science education. And uh, for different uh, level teachers, we have different training systems and uh, different courses. And uh, uh, we have also uh, developed two, two, uh, 29 modules for teachers in kindergartens and uh, primary schools uh, in four uh, domains, uh, such as the material and the physical science in kindergarten, we use the uh, flute basketball. Different, we use different uh, flute to raise the children's the, uh, different sense. 
such as observation, uh, listening, uh, and uh, the <coughs> uh, testing different sensors, uh, different senses. And uh, in life science, uh, uh, we have developed to find the word senses and the air. The air is very, uh, very, very interesting in China because, uh, you know, in Chinese, air means kong qi, uh, kong qi means empty, means empty, nothing. Nothing in Chinese culture, air means nothing. So our children cannot, uh, cannot understand, uh, oh, nothing, there, there is nothing. But what is air? They, they do not understand. So it's very, a very interesting topic in Chinese culture. So we de developed a, mo a module for the air to help the children understand what is air. <laughs> it's very interesting. And we have about eight activities. So after all, the children can understand, oh, there is not nothing. There, there has some air <laughs> in, 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 uh, around us. So it's very, very interesting for, for our children. Um, and uh, uh, design and technology uh, uh, for the kindergarten and the grade one and two, there is a very interesting module uh, about my boat, to build a boat. And I will uh, give some more de uh, detailed information about this module. So in different grades, we have different uh, subjects and modules in different domains. Uh, and we also have published a lot of teacher's guide uh, for uh, STM, uh, for the teachers and for students, different, different ones. Uh, one of our uh, opinion is that students do not need to have the textbook. They, they do not need to have textbook. They just have the uh, record sheet or just, just a, a piece of paper. A paper it's okay, it's okay. We do not uh, recommend the children have the textbook because if they have the uh, textbook, they will follow the in instruction. They do not, they do not need to uh, open their mind to think about how to resolve this pro problem. They can just follow the instruction in textbook. So the te textbook is for teachers, not for children not for children. Uh, and we also uh, developed a, a lot of teacher materials for teachers and uh, children. We have packed the different uh, materials into a bag so the teachers can, uh, can, 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 can buy or can uh, just, uh, uh, just get, get some uh, uh, packages from us. We have integrated all the materials in, in a bag for one module. So the teachers can save a lot of time to collect different materials for, for IBSE or for LBD. So they can uh, save their time to research how to, how to uh, give the children a good lesson. Uh, so the inspiration of LBD uh, has four aspects. The first one is reformation and uh, development of science education in China. Need an uh, need, uh, effective platform to join together scientists and uh, educators. And educational reform must be implemented serious in scientific attitude and supported pers uh, persistently by scientific research. In order to uh, explore the science education reform in China, we must insist on persist persistent international cooperation and uh, communication. On the other hand, after intru uh, intru introduction, uh, introducing and uh, digesting, we must insist on developing our own materials for teach for teaching students and uh, training teachers on the basis of Chinese practice, practical situation. And uh, the fourth is uh, apply new information technology and uh, internet techno technology. So this is a framework uh, about the practice of a LLBD program uh, by Dr. Wei Yu uh, in 2008. Uh, the national standards of science education in primary schools. We have revised the national standards of science education in primary schools in 2007. Um, the content standards and the practice of LOBD provide valuable experience for this work. And this, uh, the working group includes scientists, uh, include about uh, five academicians from Chinese academic of science and uh, Chinese academic of engineering and uh, educational experts and uh, frontline teaching and research staff and uh, headed by Dr. Wei Yu. 
So uh, we have a very professional group to uh, revise the, nation, the national standards of science education in primary schools. And the fourth edge is from 2011 to now. Uh, so we turned from science education to STEM education to integrate different subjects. Uh, we have two ma major uh, tasks. The first, uh, the first one is development of STEM courses. Um, not only in schools, but also out schools. We think that uh, uh, entire uh, STEM education in, uh, include both in uh, school uh, activities and uh, out of school activities. We must integrate both, not just in school. And uh, out of school or out of school, the children has a lot of chance to do other STEM activities. So we have to integrate both. And uh, we also do a lot of STEM teacher training. Uh, this is a book uh, of principles and big ideas uh, of science education. The Chinese version, uh, version was published in July 2011. And now the second Chinese version is under translation and it will be published next year. So it's very soon, it's very soon, yeah. And uh, uh, Dr. Wei Yu has published uh, a book, What Can LBD Illustrate 10 Years Practice in 2012. She summarized the practice and the experience and the research of LBD, and uh, he, she published this book in 2012. So this book helps the Chinese uh, science teachers to uh, uh, better understand the what, it is, what is science, what is IBS, IBSC, and what is STEM in, in this book. We have summarized uh, six caric uh, characters, uh, characters of STEM courses. The first one is include STEM. And the second one is engineering design process oriented. And the third one is uh, focus on practical problems underlying study in actual situation. And the fourth is student center and uh, in initiate, uh, initiative practice. And the fifth is cooperation involved in, in entire STEM courses. And the sixth is open answers. Allow multiple right answers, not only one. Not only one, because it's very open. It's very open. And uh, this is an example about uh, the module My Boat uh, for the kindergarten children and uh, uh, grade one and grade two. So the children, uh, at first, they uh, need to ob uh, observation of the different boats. And uh, they have to uh, write or a pen, uh, why the boat can, cannot sink. And they have to uh, inquire different materials, what is sink, what is, uh, what is float. And uh, they have to design. Before they, are, they build a boat, they have to design. They have to design. And after they design, they build a boat, use uh, different materials they want. And uh, they have to follow, uh, follow their, de their design. So this is... Uh, a children build a boat with a radish. Uh, it's very interesting. It's very, uh, according to his design, he used the uh, radish. So the teacher gave him a uh, radish to build a boat. So it's very interesting. It's very open. It's very open, not just uh, 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 just special materials. The so the preparation uh, for the for uh, LBD lesson is very is a hard work for teachers. Actually, it's a hard work for teachers because she needs to prepare different kinds of materials. So it's, very, it's a very hard work. Uh, and uh, they have to test their boat sink of, of float and they have to analyze is the result and uh, improvement their the, the design and uh, uh, their uh, the, the, boat. Uh, after that, they have to uh, uh, they have to cooperation, expression, and discussion. And uh, we recommend the children to share their result to their parents. Their parents. So the, the parents will support these activities in schools and after schools. Uh, this is our National Sen Senior STEM Teacher Training in 2012. The topic is uh, creativity and diversity in uh, STEM education in 2012. And in two, uh, 2014, 
uh, the topic is bring math to science classroom. And we also have about three days training. And uh, this is our uh, training for Nanjing City for the STEM teachers uh, in, uh, in this year. And we have four stages, uh, five stages. The, fifth, the first stage is the theory and the course analysis of STEM, of STEM education. And the second stage is online. We have de developed a MOOC course online for the teachers to, uh, to, to learn what is design, what is discovery, and what is science, what is STEM. Uh, we have de developed um, MOOC courses online. And the third, third stage is uh, designing methods and uh, case anal analysis of out of school STEM courses. And the fourth stage is also online online discussion. The teachers will uh, discuss the, their experience and practice online and uh, sharing their experience. And the fifth stage is view and emu uh, emulate of out of school STEM activities. They will get together to uh, discuss, observe different uh, teachers to, uh, to uh, conduct uh, the, uh, a STEM lesson. So they also um, train have been trained and uh, discussed in this period. Uh, and this is the photos about the, our uh, teacher training. Build a bridge is a very interesting uh, STEM activities in, uh, in our uh, training systems to build a bridge. So in September 2015, uh, the MOE has published a, a national policy uh, they, uh, they said that uh, we must fully support and uh, promote STEAM education. They add an A about art, about art, STEAM education uh, in, 2000, uh, in September 2015. So this is the work of our Ministry of Education. So thanks to Dr. Wei Yu, uh, CAST MOE, uh, and uh, Research Center for Learning Science, and uh, Hans Brown Education, and the GE Foundation, and the Education Foundation. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now it's time for questions. Uh, wh where is, uh, yeah, please, uh, the two of you will. First. You know, I, I may start with just a question uh, to you, Stephen. Uh, the, I mean, I just made a research. I know the answer, but maybe the, uh, for the public, uh, what's the origin of the name 2000? Of the you know the title of the program, program 2061. So, um, why 2061? Project. Hello. So project 2061, um, uh, the name of it was actually derived from the uh, occurrence of Halley's comet. Um, so when the project started, Halley's comet, Halley's comet, Halley's comet was making its way. Um, uh, around the Earth, and um, the next occurrence of it will be in 2061. So the idea is to use that as a as sort of a, a, a milestone to say that by 2061 we should have solved all these problems, but which we know that by 2061 we'll have discovered all kinds of new ones. <laughs> so. Thank you for your presentations. I have a question to. have developed a comparison, for example, between the students uh, trained with this methodology and the performance that they uh, have compared to the students who have not been, uh, been through this program. Performance of the students that have been trained using the uh, STEM methodology with other students that have uh, been through the traditional methodology to know whether they have better performance than they or not. Yeah. You understand? Uh, yeah. So uh, I think your question is about the uh, difference and uh, LOPD, right? Yeah. So uh, we have conducted a series of uh, research about the uh, difference of traditional science education and uh, the LBD. Um, 
In uh, both in kindergarten and uh, in primary schools, we have we have set up set up the control groups and uh, the uh, experimental groups uh, in uh, different schools uh, to um, to we want to find out the difference uh, of uh, between the uh, traditional science education and uh, the and the uh, uh, LBD. But unfortunately, that uh, Maybe LBD or IBC uh, cannot uh, do very well for students in examination, in examination in Chinese examination, because uh, the, the, uh, according to different assessment method, uh, Chinese uh, exam uh, always use the uh, to test the children's uh, the knowledge about science such as just the description uh, of the science concept, not, just, not about the inquiry skills. So, so you can see that in PISA test, Shanghai got number one. Yeah, got number one in, uh, in the world. But uh, maybe in, in the next PISA test uh, conducted, uh, conducted by Dr. Wing Helen, Maybe the, the assessment method will be changed. So, uh, so uh, I don't think Chinese will get a very good test uh, result in this in this uh, PISA, uh, next PISA test. So, but uh, thank you. Well, following the previous question, I think that. Uh, and in the United States, there has been also several very interesting uh, studies comparing uh, inquiry-based science education with traditional education. And uh, following very much the guidelines of the STEM integration in K-12 that you, you described, Dr. Miles. Probably you, you are aware the uh, Smithsonian Science Education Center jointly with the uh, Department of Education did uh, the laser I3 study that is precisely a, a comparison between traditional groups and inquiry-based science education groups, just like the learning by doing model. And they have, uh, this is a study that, cost, uh, that included about uh, 60,000 students was run over five years, just finished about a few months ago, and it cost about $30 million just to make this study. But with this, I want to emphasize that it's not easy and not cheap to do this kind of uh, comparative studies with control groups and with very well-defined uh, comparison strategies. But I think this is a very interesting study, and, and tomorrow I will make some comments about it. But I think it's, it's a, the kind of study that is needed, and I am very happy that now in the United States this is done with, with a, well, a very full and comprehensive approach. Thank you. Can, can I just quickly comment on that too, that the, the National Science Foundation is acknowledging the need for increased longitudinal studies and um, they're very recently sort of taking more initiative and in thinking about um, that, that we need to, at, in a minimum three to five year studies and more clinical kinds of oriented studies that, that really do things like control groups, really mimicking the, the ways we test drugs essentially because we don't have uh, really good comparative studies and we don't have enough N to, to make any, draw any real conclusions. So um, um, thanks, thanks for commenting about that. The study that uh, I based my presentation on was actually released before the I3 study. Um, so I didn't cover that in any kind of specificity, not that I would have had time anyway. But, um, but this, this is a trend that we want to see more of. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions, comments? No? Okay. So uh, thank you very much for your nice thank you. presentations.